Let's watch the Riker Diablo 4 video. It's a long video. It's a big video. We're going to do it. We're going to we're going to go all the way through it. Riker apparently played the Diablo 4 end game. Let's get it. Hey folks, this is Riker and I got to co-host right. the latest Diablo 4 developer live stream update. We was invited me to come play the game for a few days. Well, by the way, this guy fucking farmed. I don't know what happened. But this dude, he was speed running the entire live stream. They said it was going to be 90 minutes. This dude made it like 75. Talk to devs and then co-host the stream and ask some questions, shed some insight into my experiences. Adam Fletcher would typically host these updates. So I was there to be the relief. I was there to be the Riker to Adam's Picard. Mm -hmm. So in this video, I'm going to talk about that. My experiences with playing the game so as I dive now into that, what's it like to play Diablo 4 Endgame? Uh -huh. I'm just going to say that this video will be more conversational, more live stream like, a okay, little less great. edited than my regular videos, less edited, less produced. I less actually prefer those because I find them more interesting scripted than my regular videos. So first off, I was given a suite of Endgame characters to play. I got to play every class. The characters they had set up for me ranged in level from 45 to 75. Uh -huh. And jumping in, the first thing that I wanted to do was take that level 45 rogue and go do the capstone dungeon. So to clarify, yeah, yeah. you finish the campaign. After that point, you can unlock the full suite of endgame content via completing your first capstone dungeon. That's so I guess like completing your capstone dungeon is kind of like in PoE, it's killing Katava in Act 10. Right, I mean, obviously, Katav is probably a lot easier, but that's generally how it works. How you unlock Nord the unlock maps. third world tier nightmare. But this third dungeon is. is level 50. The monsters will not scale down to your level. I so fucking love that, by the way. I love the idea that there are these objective breakpoints, and if you can't beat it, you're not good enough, and you need to fucking get good. That's it. I'm assuming they gave me a 45 character because maybe that's the level I could expect to be when I finish the campaign. And if I want to go dive straight into that capstone dungeon, I should say that the gear that I was given was the character was pretty well geared. Again, I was uh -huh. playing a rogue. That's my it was my favorite class going into this whole event. There was a synergistic build put together. And as soon as I go into that capstone dungeon, I'm like, whoa, all right. This is significantly more challenging than I expected. It's taking long to kill monsters. And as I progress my way through, I started to reach a point where I'm fighting these champion monsters and they kick my butt. I died. And like I said on the stream, I'm one of those. See, I'm really curious to see how hard this is actually going to be, because I'm thinking like, bro, I'm just going to go in there and one shot this. It's going to be a joke. But maybe not. I am very curious about this, and I hope that they continue to have harder and harder versions of these capstones, but I hope that it doesn't go infinitely. I am not a fan of infinite content. I like it to where you can beat everything and you're better than everything, and then you just maximize being better than better. Well, I was saying veteran is too easy. Can we increase the challenge of veteran? My understanding is the capstone dungeon is intended to be reflective of nightmare difficulty. Now, what I should have done at that point, or what I should have uh -huh. done instantly, was realize, okay, I should go power up before tackling this. The game is telling me, you're not good enough, but I treated it like it was Dark Souls. I really, really, really wanted to unlock nightmare difficulty, so I think... Yeah, yeah I, I think that's the way a lot of people would look at it. Now, I, I wanted to see, too, uh, somebody says, not an attack, why do you have this opinion of Diablo 4 direction when you think it's better for WoW game to be more accessible? Um, well, the reason why is because World of Warcraft is an MMO, uh, Diablo is more of an ARPG, it's more of a single-player game, so you can have more individual challenges that are still meaningful and compelling without having to dumb them down because you have dumb people in the group. I think that's number one. Uh, number two, too, is that uh, I think that I I've always been fans uh, a fan of like really really hard content things like uh, like remember I was saying how they have like legendary keys in Mythic Plus I, I absolutely think you should have that kind of stuff also I don't really think this capstone dungeon is going to be anywhere near as hard as he's making it out to be because if you can't beat it immediately you're going to be able to just get better gear and then beat it easily after you get the better gear like I don't think that if you farm out gear and you are prepared for this dungeon 
I do not think it will be challenging. I think it will be hard for people that are trying to speed run the game in the first couple of days, maybe the first week or so. But for average players, it will not be an issue. The same as Katava. Okay, you know, 45, I should be able to do this if I muscle through. I rode the struggle bus for far too long. I died far too many times, but I made yeah. it past those And elites. apparently there's a death cap, so you can't die too many times, or like you fail it. On to... to I don't want to give spoilers here. I'll just say there was a boss fight after that, and yeah, sure. I had to learn the mechanics. I had to learn That's the mechanics. Awful. I'm so uh, sorry. Altogether, I had to go back. I had to do some upgrades. So I changed my build a lot. I re-specialized a lot into single target damage. This was even before, just to handle the elites. Mm -hmm. I actually went back to town and I crafted, fully upgraded all of my gear. I didn't change the gear that I had, but I used the crafting system to upgrade the gear to its max to be able to put up enough to put out enough damage to actually take down the boss fight. So overall, I would say that it's a gear check and a skill check. Now, I'm not a pro player. I, I wonder how hard it really is. I want, I want to see this combat. Like, what are we really talking about here? I am, uh, I'd say maybe I'm above average. If you look at the grand scale of all players that play, sure, I'm above average, but I am nowhere near a uh, super skilled player. Yeah, yeah, sure. In the beta, I hardly died. Uh, I would say I pretty I'm much only died against same. a Shava. Just to give you some ballpark of, you know, I'm not total garbage, but I'm sure that there will be pro-level players that will be able to handle... I mean, to be fair, also, um, pro-level players, this is an ARPG, like, what are we really talking about, pro-level players? But yeah, people that are very good at the game. Yeah, sure. That encounter with either fewer deaths or no deaths, but, again, if you're hardcore, I would not just waltz in casually... And I think that level difference as well really, really makes a difference. Because my next capstone dungeon experience, the second one to unlock the highest difficulty tier, I believe that's at 75, I was the same level as the dungeon. And that one went so much better. Despite it being the higher tier capstone dungeon, I was of the correct level. The See, that's, see, that's exactly what I was saying. Like, I don't think these are going to be like, this is not going to be doing at Ziri on day one of a poe league this is not going to be trying to uh, uh do nax 40 with molten core gear it, it's it's gonna be fine the initial part i'll say i breezed through but then the boss fight that was a big challenge again i overcame it but i died multiple times again i needed to learn That's the impressive. boss mechanics to understand Okay, when am I getting one shot here? I had to change up my build a bit to be able to sus to survive one shots. And by the way, the respecking, while I didn't do full respecs, I respect quite a bit. You generate gold rather rapidly. Can you do full respecs constantly throughout the day? No, but you could afford to respec quite a bit. Even at level 75, I was respecting Okay, things. so respecs are not going to be this oppressive bullshit. Thank God. That's very uh, it's very much a relief. I was earning back the gold. It wasn't a big deal. But again, I wasn't doing full respects. I was redoing some Paragon nodes. I think I respect the whole Paragon board. I changed up some skills, but I yeah, didn't yeah. completely alter my build. But yeah, I had to spec more into survivability to just sustain the fight. I had to learn to better play my build. That's another thing as well, right? I'm jumping in there with a build that I've not played before, so I'm learning how it works. I'm learning how the mechanics of the build work, I'm learning how the mechanics of the fight work, and again, <laughs> I would almost advise a hardcore player, maybe just try softcore first, just to know what you're up against. Well, I think uh, most people that are hardcore players are going to be behind the curve because they can't take as many risks as softcore players, so, like, it's the same thing as whenever people killed Maven and, uh, you know, Cirrus for the first time on hardcore, uh, they had already seen kind of what the fight was. I'm, I'm going to be super impressed with all you hardcore players who are going to, on your first go, survive all these fights.
In general, things are well telegraphed, but it's a skill check. You're going to have split seconds to react to what you're seeing. And if you're not spec for survivability, there will be one shots. At oh, that wow. point, I was playing a sorcerer, and I basically changed my build around to generate shields every time I used a cooldown. And I was timing my skills in okay. cadence with the boss's attacks to ensure that I always had a shield up whenever one of his attacks were coming. Because I had a lot of difficulty dodging some of the boss attacks. And again, if you're off by that fraction of a second, bam. It was enough damage to one-shot me if I didn't have my shield up. So again, I do worry about that. Uh, there are some mechanics. It's like, you know that one boss in the stronghold that would shoot bats at you at melee range and, like, one-shot you if you weren't paying attention? I, I, I do feel like there are some mechanics. Like, Blizzard is a, a Blizzard is one of the developers that values immersion more than gameplay. And I find that to be a bad thing. I think that there's nothing less immersive than a shitty mechanic or something that you can't really see very well. So hopefully that these mechanics that Riker is talking about will be very well telegraphed and easy to understand and see. I think Lost Ark is a great example of a game that can have incredibly difficult and very challenging mechanics, but simultaneously make them easy to see and easy to understand. Final Fantasy is another example. So we don't need to have, you know, black on black on black on black, right? Or gray on gray on dark gray on light gray on gray on black on white, you know? Like, let's... Let, 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 let's make it easy to see so people know what to do. I wiped against that boss multiple times, but it felt so good to overcome the challenge and then unlock that highest tier difficulty. I would say that the capstone is on average more difficult than the average content of that world tier. That is, if you're just out, you know, in the open world, it's not like everything there is going to be as challenging as the capstone. Yeah, of course. That was another reason that I was trying to really muscle through to unlock it because better loot drops in the next world tier. Oh, and yeah, that exactly. I mean, this is just that makes sense, right? You want to go as high as you can. That way, like, you know, as soon as you beat this challenge, then you can get all the other rewards that are a little bit easier. Sure. Loot is then going to start powering you up more. Now, to clarify, you don't need to even do your first capstone dungeon to start doing endgame content. You just only get access to Nightmare Dungeons and Helltide once you are in the World Tier 3 Nightmare. Before that, though, you could be doing the Whispers of the Dead. That's typically how you would get your first like Nightmare up. Sigils. So, Nightmare Sigils are used to open Nightmare Dungeons. You get your first of those via the the bounties the tree of whispers in my case i was given characters that had a full inventory of nightmare sigils so that i didn't have to farm that stuff up so nightmare dungeons will be a core part of the end game loop you're going to start again by getting your first nightmare sigils they're going to be like the tier one ones they have different tiers i hope of they don't make them hard to get every single uh league and poe where it was hard to get maps was a shit league like, I, I hate it whenever it's hard to get maps. Like, right now, it's not like that at all, and it's great. I hate Escalating having to find difficulty. maps. You get your first via the Tree of Whispers. Then after that, once you are inside a Nightmare Dungeon, you can get other sigils to drop. That'll be for higher tiers. Mm -hmm. So I'm running a Tier 1. Then inside, maybe I'll get a Tier 2 or whatever, some higher tier, and it goes on and on. Great. That's generally how you're going to continue to farm your Nightmare Sigils. If at some point you're unhappy with the sigils that you have, mm -hmm. you can break them down into crafting materials and craft your own nightmare sigils at the occultist. This could be either because you want higher. Okay, so nightmare sigil is used to transform a dungeon into a nightmare dungeon, creates a sigil. Afflictions three, so that's affixes, requires world tier three. Okay, all right, sure, that makes sense. Your tier one, so you're gobbling down your lower tier ones to get higher tier ones or you uh, Riker does good video basically never says bad things about what blizzard so he can't really trust what he says well i'm not trusting what he says i'm trusting i'm trusting what i'm hearing like i actually that's probably a bad way to say it yeah never mind let's undo that one uh i i'm i'm not believing everything that he's saying i'm just simply listening to it and making my own decision Everybody, I, I please let, let's let, let's let's try to get away from this world where you think that there are actually people that are unbiased or or not. 
you have to listen to people understand what they're saying and make your own decision. I'm not listening to Riker because I want Riker to tell me what to think. I'm listening to Riker for the information that he's trying to explain with the Diablo 4 endgame, and then I make that decision myself. I don't know, you hate the map, you hate the dungeon, or you don't like the affixes that roll, because there's randomization of the affixes that roll on those nightmare sigils. Right. Now, the sigils come in, I'm going to say tears again. There's I mean, it's, they, they call them tears, bro. I mean, it is what it is. Nightmare, nightmare sigils. And then there are torment nightmare sigils. Okay. That's the main distinction. It's torment like corrupted. In the nightmare tier ones, you can die up to 12 times before okay. you fail. And then in the highest tier one, the again, I'll call them the torment tier. I don't know what the proper term is. Oh, if there okay. is one, you can only die four times. And yes, all the hardcore players... You can only die four times. Uh, you can only die four times inside of a dungeon. I think that's pretty much fine. Like, if you're dying more than four times inside of one of these dungeons, it's probably because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. ...are, you know, insulting us right now. I get it, I get it. So you're farming Nightmare Dungeons in order to get more sigils to run so four more and six. higher yeah, level exactly. Nightmare Dungeons to get more higher level loot. And also the main thing at the and end... And also, like, they have to have a death counter. This is the problem, right? Is that they have to have a death counter. Because if they don't, what people are going to do is they're just going to keep throwing themselves at, mo at mobs and bosses until they clear the dungeon and get the better loot. And it will be, like, a very bad gameplay experience that, like, you're supposed to suicide onto these monsters over and over and over. And it takes you, like, 20 deaths to kill one monster, but it drops really good gear, so you still want to do it. It's like a very weird fucking way of playing the game. So they kind of have to do this. As much as I don't like death penalties, it's pretty much mandatory unless you want to have some hard item level cutoff kind of like what new world has with mutations where it's like if you don't have the item level you simply can't do damage to certain npc levels uh, on mutation high levels which is also i i think that's worse than having a death count kind of a nightmare dungeon is you're more going gamey. to level up your glyphs glyphs are things that you insert into your paragon tree. yeah i think these are the glyphs are great i'm very happy i mean they're gems or jewels and in, in poe very happy to see this this is nice three they're some of the most powerful things in fact once leveled up sufficiently that you'll have in your paragon tree so a core part of increasing your character's power will come from leveling up your glyphs, finding glyphs, first off, finding glyphs, finding the right glyphs for your build, and leveling them up. You can argue that it's similar to legendary gems in Diablo 3, but there's more complexity to it because you've got- That's true, leveling them up. You don't really level anything up in PoE, you just buy a new one, other than maybe exalting or putting like an implicit on, the, on a jewel. Uh, but yeah, definitely to be inserting the glyphs into the paragon board and in a slot that is meaningful we'll talk more about glyphs in a bit here when we talk about the paragon boards mm -hmm. again my main focus in playing the game was to understand what am i going to be doing every day in diablo 4 what is the experience going to be why am i doing the different activities that are available to me now on average the difficulty in nightmare dungeons not nearly the same as in the capstone dungeons capstone is definitely far more challenging i kind of like how there is like a benchmark and if you can't play at this level you can't you can't get the rewards but i kind of like how you don't always have to play at that level it's not like this constant fucking meat grinder of like inferno diablo or like original inferno diablo where you're just like you have to be like fucking laser focused dialed in locked in super fucking ready make one mistake it's fucking over yeah absolutely not i'm glad that there's a little bit more chill content that's probably a good thing except for like probably at the highest tier of content let's see here yeah, Elden Ring being able to go to a different boss. Yeah, exactly. It's like once you 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 hit that break point, you can move on. But Nightmare Dungeons as well, I mean, you effectively get to make them as challenging as you want, mm -hmm. given that you could unlock higher and higher Nightmare Sigils. So at baseline, that the, the baseline... Yeah, I'm very glad, I want to say again, that the Nightmare Sigil Dungeons stop at 20.
Like, I don't want to go infinite fucking, ah, there's like 700 affixes. They have, you know, 7,000%. I, I, I just want to be able to beat the game. Those are easy enough to run. And if you want to be farming more rapidly and more efficiently, then you can run lower tier sigils. But again, you're rewarded because you only have a finite number of resources of of these mm -hmm. sigils. You are rewarded for not just doing the easiest content over and over, but rather for, I guess, tackling the content that you can efficiently handle. Well, you're always making a decision, right? Do you want to do harder content slower or easier content faster? And there's different builds that are good at each thing. Efficiently, I suppose, an asterisk as we figure out what efficiently means in this game. In Diablo 3, efficiently means two and a half to five minutes. But yeah. all this to say that nightmare dungeons are certainly things where you don't have to be slamming your head against uh, difficulty-wise. The most challenging things that I experienced were those capstone dungeons. Now, one concern I have about the nightmare dungeons is that in the seasons, we'll want to do... or We'll probably want to do all the Nightmare Dungeons, or all the regular dungeons, rather, once, but only 30 will become Nightmare Dungeons uh, every season, and that will rotate, so there'll be different Nightmare Dungeons. Yeah, they're doing it like they do with WoW Dungeons, uh, like Mythic Plus, which is, I think, probably a good thing. Every season. My concern, I can already foresee people complaining, like, hey, how come we can only do these 30 dungeons out of the, you know, 115? Why can't you just let us do all 115, or however many... Uh, dungeons that are in the game as nightmare dungeons again this is something that we'll only really realize after we experience the season we'll find out whether they're third yeah well i i feel like for mythic plus for example i think that the success i think they were successful it was successful because you can you don't i, I didn't feel bad that i wasn't able to do all of the like uh the, the dragon flight dungeons i thought it was fine is enough or not and i'm sure if it's not enough they'll be mm -hmm. open to increasing that number so that pretty much covers the nightmare dungeons then there's helltide and helltide is where you can target farm specific item drops we'll explain why in a bit okay. as well as it's pretty much oh the only yeah place that's that that's the one with the boxes and you can open up different boxes of like gloves or different boxes of uh fucking weapons etc uh, i know diablo 3 had something like this were you able to buy from like this like girl and she would sell you oh yeah well they had it in a diablo 4 beta yeah you can get certain important crafting materials so these the helltide and the nightmare dungeons are mm -hmm part of your core gameplay loop at the end you have reason for wanting to do both of them and there are things in each that you cannot get in the other that said it sounds like xp xp farming will not be relegated to one or the other I asked about this and they said monster density should kind of be the same so that's good yeah you don't want to make it to where one thing is just way easier to do somebody made a comment about this i want to respond to it uh capstone dungeons are the most difficult content in the game is really bad what incentive do i have to grind tier four whenever i've beaten the capstone dungeon to unlock it which is the hardest thing in the game let me explain how i think it's going to work this is how i i believe that it's going to work uh so um this is uh, i guess like challenge uh yeah a l l e n g e this is challenge and this is uh difficulty so i think that it's going to be like this so the challenge is going to go up and then you're going to have your capstone dungeon right here and then it's going to go probably down and then back up and then you're going to have your next capstone dungeon then it's going to go down and then back up and then you're going to have your next capstone dungeon and it's going to go down you guys see kind of what i'm saying right so like this is still going to be harder than the capstone dungeon but you 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 basically you get over the the hill right and the, you're moving downhill but you don't only move downhill, right? This is capstone, uh, let, let's say like two, three, and then four. So there will be content in the game that's harder than the fourth capstone dungeon. Obviously there will be. But it's immediately after you, after you are finished with the fourth capstone dungeon, you can enjoy the rewards of completing it. 
And then after you get, you know, more geared in that fourth world tier, then you start taking on the challenges that are even farther beyond that capstone dungeon that you accomplished in order to get in there in the first place. That is what, this is the way I think they're going to design it. And I think it's fine. Are there pinnacle bosses? I think so. How much time between each one, I wonder? I, I don't know. But I think this is a good way to, this is a good way to do it. Yeah, capstone dungeon equals an earned save point. Kind of. Um, let, let me think of like, what is a good example of a capstone dungeon? Like a threshold. Oh, fuck. I, I don't know. I'd have to really think about like, what would be a good analogy for it? But it's kind of like in, in, let's say, Dark Souls or Elden Ring, whenever you beat a really hard boss, and then after that hard boss, you're able to farm mobs more easily that can give you way more runes. Uber, Uber Lab? Yeah, I think Uber Lab is actually a really great example. Yeah. Because most of the time, whenever somebody does Uber Lab, it's harder than anything that they have done before that. It's not like in Diablo 3, for instance, where there is an activity to do that is the maximum XP farm. Asterisk, I'm sure pro gamers will find oh, what yeah. is the most effective thing to do for XP farm, but... I did that 10 years ago with Diablo 3. I made videos about it. Those were some good fucking days, boys. Man. And you know what? Back then, you know who one of the other guys that was making videos I was always competing against was? Fucking Riker. This guy was like, man, this guy makes as many videos as I do. What the fuck? This guy was making videos even back 10 years ago. I remember him. From a design perspective, there nothing is designed to be, oh, this is what you want to do to grind XP. Quinn, yeah. So I think we didn't have time to really dive too much into it, but Helltide has a bunch of random events that can spawn within it that are different and distinct from the random events that naturally spawn in that zone. So Helltide is basically something that takes over an existing zone in the game. It, In addition to having the regular monsters spawn there, it starts to spawn demons. And in addition to that, well, I thought Helltide... regular monsters were also demons, but okay, yeah, I get, what, yeah, I get what he's saying, right? They're special fucking demons. I'd specific events. I think they override. Yeah, they override the regular zone events. So there's a few different Helltide events that can spawn. I'm not gonna get into spoilers there. There's also roaming monsters. Sorry, rather roaming boss monster encounters that you can run into. It's overall Helltide is pretty challenging. It's not sure. slam your face against a wall challenging, but it. I feel like Helltide is going to be a lot like the invasions in WoW, like you know Legion invasion and Legion, a uh, you know like the Horde and Alliance invasions in BFA, and the uh, I think there there was the Maw invasions. I think they're going to be pretty easy. They'll probably have some elite mobs that are kind of hard to kill, but it, it's not really going to be super challenging. Is this just a tactic to keep people playing for a while, considering they won't play all dungeons and they'd have to wait maybe four months till they can do them again? Uh, I mean, maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that's really the reason why they're doing it. But, yeah, I mean, it, you could look at it that way, sure. There's a marked increase in difficulty within Helltide and outside of Helltide. And I think I could talk about this. It wasn't touched upon in the stream. Again, there was just so much to talk about and not enough time. But... Well, first off, to lay the foundation. Within the Helltide, you are collecting cinders, and those cinders are used to open up different chests that are found throughout the Helltide. They spawn... Yeah, you find it. It's, it's just very simple. They explained it in a good way. I think it's clean. It's a good way for them to design it. He has been watching for a couple of years now. It's turned 18. I don't know if you're wishing me a happy birthday. Happy birthday, man. Uh, welcome to taxes, health insurance, car payments, and a mortgage. Enjoy your stay. In random locations, so your flow of gameplay within Helltide is kill oh, your way- uh, scheduling your own doctor uh, appointments. Forgot that one. Okay, around exploring to find where the different chests are. Every chest will have an icon above it showing a gear slot, like boots or two-handed weapon. Sign and it'll draft. show you the cinder cost to open that chest. So you're killing your way around, you're picking up cinders, and you're determining which chest do I want to open. Now there's, and again, I, I think I could say this, there's one chest that's randomly within the area. I'm not sure if it always spawns, but it is not marked on the map. And it's like a super secret chest. It's some kind of uber chest. And I think typically randomly roaming around the area near said chest is some uber boss. So 
high risk, high risk. I am always super skeptical whenever I hear something like this because this sounds like something that was cooked up in a room full of dudes agreeing with each other, talking about how, how, about how great their ideas are. Let's see how this plays. I think the most important thing for like any of these systems is let's see the gameplay. Let's see how people actually respond to this content rather than imagining what's cool and what's not cool. So I'm very skeptical, especially whenever I hear language like that. Reward, beware, you're encouraged to <laughs> scout around, find things. Because again, if you die Overwolf in Helltide, you coming. lose yeah. half your cinders. They don't drop on the ground, they are gone. Deleted. Helltide lasts one hour. So my first Helltide, I joined in with only 20 minutes left. So I only had, could farm up a certain amount of cinders. But you want to be making choices again on, all right, what gear slot am I target farming for? If you're searching for unique items, for instance, you know exactly what unique you might be hunting for. Maybe a Shaco, a Harlequin Crest, rather. You're going to be looking for that. You know, okay, Helm, I got to find the Helm slot. I'm going to go for that. Right. Or if you just have one slot that's really weak and you want to upgrade it, you can target farm for that. The odds of getting good rewards in general seems pretty good. And the spawn rate of Helltide seems to be one hour on, one hour off. So... Once one Helltide ends, the next one will start an hour later in another random... I think random that might be too fast, but we'll have to see what happens, right? ...location within the world. In the meantime, you could be doing your Nightmare Dungeons, you could be doing your Whispers, you could be doing World Bosses, or if you happen to spawn at the right time. Mm -hmm. Now, on the topic of the cadence of one hour on, one hour off, um, I will note that in general I'm someone who likes to have full agency over what I have access to playing in a game. I don't know how big of a deal is it, I mean, especially now the way I play, it's not a big deal to have one hour off, but I used to be someone who wanted to just jump into a game, play for 15 minutes when I had time during the day, and no, I think- like I did this with PoE the other day, right? This was like before my stream yesterday, I, I logged on to PoE, I did a few maps, and uh, it was fun, right? I played for maybe a half hour, an hour, and then I logged off. Now, I, I think having moment-to-moment -moment gameplay like that is really nice to have. If I were still that kind of gamer, I would be disappointed to hear, oh, I logged in, Helltide's not available right now. Yeah, Here's one less thing that I have to do. Maybe I get lucky a few days in a row and every time I log into play, Helltide is off. I'm not sure how much of an issue it would be to just have Helltide on mm -hmm. all the time in different zones in the game. I suppose the concern there might be that if it's always on, then people might it's, only it becomes do boring, Helltide. Yeah. But again, I'm not sure that's really much of a people problem. People if people want to do something, let them do it. The way it is... I, I do think that he, he's right about this, but this is the problem with imbalance. Is that imbalance actually removes alternatives and removes other things that you can do. Because what really matters is that whenever somebody plays the game, if they know that the one thing they can do is, uh, you know, do this one activity and this is going to give you all the money, then that's the only thing they can do. It's kind of like in a game where like there's one overpowered character and then everybody just plays that one character. So that's why balance is important. Balance is important because it allows people to make a choice. Because whenever one, uh, one character or one uh, method of gameplay is just so much better, nobody else is going to do the other ones because it just completely outshines them. So it is important to make sure these things are balanced. Now I am okay with it. I'm just concerned if we're going to pave the way for a lot of things like this in the future that are all going to be on different schedules. One thing that I started to find tedious in Lost Ark, for instance, was, okay, at this time this does this, at that time that does that. I have a whole calendar. The game literally yeah. gives you a calendar in order to keep track of upcoming things and ensure that, okay, I go to this island to do this at this time, and then I go there to do that at that time. Yeah. I just want to play the game whenever I want, on my own schedule, on my own time, and not be gated out of activities. I, I will disagree with this, actually. I think the way Lost Ark does timed events is totally fine. I have no issue with it. I think it's totally okay. Like, of the issues in Lost Ark, I don't even really think that one's on the list. I think there are a million islands that you can do that are not on a timer. Having some spontaneous, sporadic content, I think, does add an element of spice to things, even though I can understand what he's saying, that I don't have time to do it right now. Why can't I do it right now? And I do have time to do it right now. Why, why, why do I have to do it right now? Sure, I totally get it. But I do think it's probably better for the game that things happen. Uh, spontaneous it's on the clock uh yeah yeah I mean I guess like uh, sp like um inconsistent 
right? It's not on all the time. Spontaneous, you're right, it's on the clock, bad, bad word to use. But uh, yeah, things that are available sometimes, but not always. Based on different times. Yeah, that's the first If one the I concern think. is being able to do an activity too much, I would rather have some resource that I can farm in order to partake in the activity on my schedule. So let's say a Helltide key that you unlock and then bam, you consume it. And now a zone becomes Helltide within your instance. For argument's sake, this doesn't have to be for Helltide, but for other such events. Right. Some people suggest that for world bosses, for instance. And I don't find this to be an issue. I really don't think it's a big deal. I'm also a person who plays video games all day, every day, and has very limited responsibilities outside of that that are on like a specific time clock, right? I don't have to go to work at a certain time. Uh, you know, I have responsibilities, but I kind of decide when those are going to happen. So maybe maybe I am the minority here, but personally, I don't find it to be a big deal that certain events happen at certain times in a game. I, I don't think it's a big deal. As long as it's not like super... Like there is a spectrum, by the way. And I'll give you an example of a bad spectrum. Vanilla... Uh, not vanilla. Uh, Mists of Pandaria world bosses. Do you remember whenever Galleon would spawn at the beginning of Mists of Pandaria? And there'd be like 8,000 people there. And he would die in two minutes. And it's like, if you're not there, it's over. That was so fucking garbage. So I, I do hope that you don't have things like that. But having bosses that spawn semi-regularly, I think, is okay. That pretty much covers the core it's a spectrum. end game gameplay loop. Now, how does that all tie into Sailing events progression? Yeah, well, this is related to sacred and ancestral items. So again, you're playing on veteran or normal difficulty. You have yet to unlock world tier three. You're only getting normal items. You're gonna be fully decked out in legendaries probably by the time you finish the campaign. That's Otherwise, nice. before completing the, your first capstone dungeon, you'll likely fill in all those slots. Great. Two legendaries, hopefully legendaries that are helping your build. You might even be leveling up that gear at the blacksmith to make that gear more powerful, but there is basically a finite amount of power that you can get from items below world tier three. Sure. Once you unlock world tier three, then bam, big sacred deal. items can start dropping. Okay. These items are going to be on average better than the gear you've been able to find up to this point. Yeah, I get it. And this is sure. when the gear stops leveling with you. You can get a drop that might be good all the way through level 70. So it's a little bit similar to Diablo 2. Once you This is like PoE as well. Like, there are times where I would get something in Act 6 and I would use it until red maps. Like, I just randomly get some really good pair of boots that has like 80 life, 2 res, and uh, 30 move speed or 25 move speed. Or 3 res and no move speed. And I just needed the res complete normal then you start playing on nightmare and now you get exceptional items that can start dropping so again the flow of progression is going to be you're pretty much maxing out your normal gear uh -huh. by the time you unlock world tier three and then you're going to start getting upgrades again and as you're progressing your way up to about level 70 75 to get world tier three unlocked which again, I'm sure like super pro players will probably unlock it at higher, uh, rather lower level. Oh yeah, I think people are gonna get into world tier four in like two or three days at most. I, I bet it's gonna be super fucking easy. Then the rest of us, mind you, they'll also be farming XP far more efficiently than the rest of us. So who knows? Maybe and we'll by the way, that's totally fine. Absolutely, totally, completely fine. Not a bad thing at all. Wait. Well, until the appropriate yeah. level to do it but regardless your flow works, yeah. then is sort of starting the loop all over again of gearing progression where okay well now you're getting your somebody says sorry i don't want to pause again uh somebody says uh we keep talking about pro players the reason why is that gaming like gaming communities are fixated around what pro players do much more so than like how a game really should play so like if they see pro players like, I remember this in BFA, where, like, rogues were really good in Mythic Plus. And if you were a rogue, you just got auto-invited. And Shadow Priests were really bad in Mythic Plus. And if you were a Shadow Priest, you never got invited. Even though the truth is, Shadow Priests could do a plus 25, no problem. But just people follow trends. People are metagamers. That's what happens. So it, it, it shouldn't matter what pro players do. But what pro players do does massively influence how people play the game. 
it's like whenever um you know like whenever a really popular build comes out in poe right uh well, let's say like righteous fire gets buffed and pox is making 10 videos about righteous fire guess what fire maces that have plus one all fire skills are going to be costing a lot more fucking money that leak uh mathel makes a video about a really good build guess what's going to be really fucking expensive I remember somebody made a uh, a video about Explody Totems is like that now about cold iron points. People use those for uh, a goblin, not goblin, uh, golem builds. And guess what? Cold iron points were two fucking divines. Whenever they should be ten C. It was crazy. The perception, yeah, it's yeah the mathel effect. There you go. New drops you got to start looking at again. In my case, well, I wasn't really yeah, upgrading yeah. my gear because I was given a full suite of gear Those that was jewels. appropriate for my build. And so legendaries were not raining from the sky. They seemed to be dropping at uh, an appropriate rate. Fire I did see them, yeah. but the odds of getting a legendary that was good for my build was relatively low so i would have to not only just find a base item that was an upgrade i would also have to find a legendary essence to extract and put onto it or otherwise just i don't mind that by the way i think building gear i'm not a big fan of you have to drop gear i think having gear drop that's like really really fucking good randomly is awesome but i think that it's probably better if you build and work towards gear an item that was altogether really strong. Another thing I should clarify, if you're invested in the it, you affixes know? on the gear that I had were also well suited for my build. So uh -huh. now I was in a position where the items that it's are dropping, mix, yeah. if they're not rolling, you know, a bunch of good affixes, then it's a lot harder to replace just because some of the numbers are bigger when I'm losing some very important affixes on my gear, such as plus to skills. You do have a certain amount of agency in re-rolling that one property if you bring an item yeah. to the, the the mystic or whatever the character is called that lets you enchant an item and re-roll one property. But nonetheless, I was going from a build that pretty much had all the properties that were useful to me to then needing to find items that would have only one bad property that I can then re-roll into something good. I anticipate this to not be the case for most people. I doubt by the end of normal or and by the way you can buy these because these items are tradable yellow items are tradable veteran or whatever difficulty i doubt you'll be in a position where your gear is perfect and so it should be a lot easier to find replacements and gear upgrades as you move into world tier three you will however start to face some decisions on ooh, well this is a much better weapon i'm dealing a lot more damage but i would lose a certain legendary power because i'm going to be swapping out that that's good making decisions like that is good because it gets you thinking about the game this uh, legendary weapon for a rare weapon in the case of a weapon i think the damage is generally worth it depending on what that affix that legendary affix is going to be and this is also now when unique items can start dropping at world tier three now, then, once you unlock World Tier 4, this cycle effectively repeats itself. Now you're unlocking the highest tier, the Ancestral items. And, again, probably by the time you're there, your gear is in pretty good shape. And you'll now be able to start upgrading it once again. But I imagine Great. throughout World Tier 3, it's not that all of your gear is instantly garbage. It's not like your World Tier 1 gear is... You just toss it all out and pick up everything and, and it's all upgrades. You will be holding... Yeah, I didn't like that with Lost Ark. How you would get this, like, really good gear. You'd work towards all of your gear in, like, Tier 2 and Tier 1. And then the moment you hit the item level for... Uh, and I think that's a good example, right? It's like uh, Tier Thresholds in Lost Ark from Tier 1 to 2 or 2 to 3. It's like as soon as you hit the item level for that... All of your good gear from Tier 2 that you invested so much in is just literal garbage compared to blues in Tier 3. And it's like the content is like you just got done doing Alaric Sanctum, an 8-player raid, and then you do a Chaos Dungeon, and it gives you 302 item level gear, 1302 item level gear. It's like already better. What the fuck? Right? I, I think that's kind of silly. Holding on to stuff. Maybe there's going to be a legendary affix that you can't find again, so you need to hold on to a certain item that's key to your build. 
And similarly, moving into world tier 4, maybe there's going to be some unique you found in world tier 3 at level, you know, 51 that you don't want to get rid of. Maybe that's your GG item for the rest of, you know, all the way up to level 100. You might yeah, have a sure. few gear slots that you're going to be holding on to because, oh, I got these really good rolls. Remember whenever I got that fucking, uh, that life ring from Mirror of Calandra that had, like, uh, fucking 170 life on it, and I never replaced it for the entire league, and I got it at, like, level 50? I was insane. It had two resists and yeah, at like even though 50%. technically better items are Disgusting. dropping, it's not like there's Lake such a thing as yeah. gear score that is more than just a number. It's not like a higher level item is inherently superior than a lower level item. Affixes yeah, will matter. It's just that the higher tier items, the ancestral items, uh -huh can roll higher stats. Yeah, sure. Also, some uniques are going to be far rarer than others, is another thing to bear in mind. Now, I didn't get to experience this because it's only something that comes from months of playing the game, but it does sound like this is the god drop that I've always been hoping for. You have some items that are super rare. I'm not sure if they should have, like, I, I think that really, materials might. You know, a Diablo 2 materials might. Is that something that you really want to see? I don't really want to see something that's that rare. However, I do want to see something that's extremely rare, like Mage Blood or like, uh, uh, let me think, like a Brass Dome, Mage Blood, uh, Headhunter, uh, Aegis Aurora. Uh, I, I think those are the, the ones I can think of right off the top of my head. So the reason why is that all of those items you're able to get in other ways. So I think that like with divination cards, for example, like apothecary or doctor or whatever, right? Like as long as you can get other, as long as you can get these items in another way, it's totally fucking fine. Or at least more rare than all the other items, such that when you get one, you feel not so just like farming awesome random. to have found it. This is something that I was hoping for D4. Sounds like it should be in the game. All right, now for the Paragon boards. Mm -hmm. I was someone who, when I first saw the Paragon boards, you know, I guess a while ago, I, was, I wasn't terribly impressed with them. I just sort of had the idea that, okay, it's going to be a board with some, like, random, yeah, sure. you know, selection of pseudo-random attributes, uh, lots of plus two basic stats, and then you're going to have that legendary node that is probably going to be the only real interesting thing on the Paragon board. But I had my eyes opened when I saw the assortment. I think every class gets, I want to say, seven to eight Paragon boards. They are all themed around that central legendary power and that's the part that made them really interesting to me i started to now it, okay. it completely changed my perspective on paragon boards i started to think of it more like it, it's almost like an ascendancy class in poe or a prestige class in in dungeons and dragons or you know last epoch has its specialization class as well uh -huh. sort of thing uh you know not quite to that extent because you can select eventually multiple boards but on the Necromancer, for instance, like, okay, here's a board that is for the ultimate minion Necromancer. Sure. So that central legendary node does something very powerful. I think on average, the legendary powers on the Paragon board are more powerful than legendary affixes. So this is something significant. Wow. By the way, That's the legendary... I didn't expect that. I thought they would be pretty minimal. Power or unique power on a unique item is a couple Great. times it's some it's some multiplier on average more powerful than a legendary power just to put some sense of scale in there so you have in order of increasing power i believe you have your basic legendary powers so uh -huh. you have your paragon board legendary node, uniques and then you have your unique affix or unique legendary power that would be the most powerful of the three yeah yeah on average but going back to the Paragon board, so again, you have your, your Summoner Necromancer. That legendary power is something that is comparable to, in design, a legendary power on an item, but a little bit more powerful. And then you have your Rare and your Magic nodes that are thematically tied in. So the least interesting thing on the Paragon board is just the basic nodes, plus where it's five. just plus two different stats. Yeah. And there's no such thing as main stat in D4. You could want different stats on your character for different reasons, whether you're going for more crit or whether you're going for more resource generation or what sure. have you. Sometimes even your glyphs will make you want to build for a certain I, I, stat. I, I think when he's talking about like main stat, we're talking about like willpower, stamina, or like uh, vitality, strength, and dexterity. 
I don't think we're going to see a lot of intelligence builds with Warriors. Like, because obviously, a the lot secondary of, stats are going to have different reasons. There are mechanics within the Paragon board that turn on or activate based on how much of a certain stat you have. So you might yeah, find yourself building fine. a stat for the sole purpose of unlocking a better effect on the Paragon board. From a design perspective, this was the idea of, okay, in D2, for instance, there are certain items that you cannot equip unless you have X strength. They wanted to take that same concept, but make it less punishing and move it elsewhere so they have it on the paragon board where well if you if you don't have this amount of a certain affix you won't get this more powerful bonus effect okay so to use as an example on the paragon board for the ultimate summoner necro the legendary power could be something like your minions deal 10 percent more damage for each minion type you have okay thereby encouraging you to use all the different minions and rewarding you for doing so yeah right then your Menagerie. individual yeah Rare Zoom. nodes could be stuff like plus, uh, you know, 15% damage to Skeletal Mage. And then the blue nodes could be something like plus 5% to minion armor. But they're basically all themed, again, outside of the regular nodes, they're all themed around the central theme and fantasy of the Paragon board. Now, one issue with the Paragon boards is you can't plan ahead. There's currently no planner built into the game. So once you unlock the Paragon boards, well, now you might want to completely change your build or otherwise... I think there I, should be a planner. I don't know why games don't have that. It doesn't make any sense to not have that. It's like just like... I don't know why so many video games have this fixation into leading their players into a trap. Please stop doing this. I guess what you would do is you would see what build am I running now, which Paragon board best fits the playstyle that I'm going for. Alternatively, you might say, oh, dang, this is a really powerful mm -hmm. Paragon board, or now that you're seeing them all, you might decide, okay, I want to combine these, and I'll completely respect my build around the Paragon board. Uh, overall, I, I definitely hope that at some point they can add into the game a Paragon board planner. I'm sure that there will be external resources, websites that people can go to in order to do this planning. I just like when things are available to us within the game, the less you need to tab out or have a second monitor up to do things. You should never have to utilize a, a third-party website to play the game. Every time that you have to tab out of a game is, I think, a fuck-up by the game. I think it's the same thing with WoW. I think that PoE, like, there are a lot of things with PoE that they do not need to be that complicated. It does not make the game better. Nearby, close... Far, less, more, increased, reduced, increased, added. It does not have to be like this. Please, Chris, fucking fix this in PoE 2. Should not have to use, like, I, bro... Fucking path of building. I was going to open it up. I don't want to open it up. I'll, I'll open it up right now. Look at this shit. This is how you play Path of Exile. What the fuck is this? This, this, this is this is insane. There's more fucking... Like, look at all of this. This is crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. What's your ward with DPS at? I don't know. Let me run five simulations and I'll tell you, uh, you know, an approximation of it. Obviously... I think that that kind of stuff is cool in a way, but I think that games that you should have path of building, but it shouldn't feel like it's mandatory. And I feel like with PoE, it feels like it's too mandatory, but in general, and I said the same thing with WoW, is that you should never have to tab out to do a, uh, fuck it, to download an add-on. You should never have to use an add-on in WoW. I think in general, empowers like players. Lost so not Ark. everyone yeah. is going to go do that. Not yeah, everyone Trixion will is go great to these other websites really good point. Uh, and use build planners and whatnot. I feel quality of life stuff should be in the game itself and not mm -hmm. have to come from the community. It's, I love community resources. Don't get me wrong. I always love when the community comes and, and adds to the but game. But they should not be mandatory. But I and, think and then the worst part is whenever the developer uses community resources as a crutch to not make the game more playable for average people. That is the, ooh, it's so bad. That's the worst thing.
is whenever the developer goes and they make the game worse and they don't improve the quality of the base game because they assume that people will figure out third-party solutions for it. I'm not thinking about any specific game. I'm thinking about two specific games. That stuff generally should be in the game by itself. One of the issues is that you can't look at what the Paragon boards are uh -huh. unless you are currently at a gate node. That's one of the nodes that'll connect to a new Paragon board. So it just makes it more difficult to plan when you can't be just bringing up a menu that shows you the Paragon boards unless you yeah. are literally in the process of adding a point to unlock a new Paragon board. It's silly. But overall, I was someone who previously didn't think the Paragon system was that interesting until I now I got way. a more holistic look at the Paragon yeah, system. I felt and the now exact same I find way. it far more interesting. After seeing the preview. So again, I got to play all five classes going into the week. My order of preference of the classes. Rogue was my favorite, followed by Necromancer, Sorcerer, Barbarian, and... <laughs> Yep. That's just about right. Uh-huh. Remember I said, oh, it's going to be different at max level. Guys, it's going to be different. No, oh, you don't understand. It's going to be, uh-huh. Yeah, I bet it is. Druid and dead last with the barbarian and the druid being classes that I wasn't crazy about and the other three being classes that I enjoyed and would want to play. We're playing a Barbarian on release. Barbarian is the the, the black swan that will uh, it will bloom into a, 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 a fucking flaming phoenix of destruction and rebirth. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be amazing. We're playing Barbarian on release. 100%. I think that order has completely reversed Might have to quit now. the game, though, if it doesn't go well. I, I still believe I'm going to start with a rogue simply because rogues have super mobility, but that mobility becomes less meaningful when the content becomes more challenging. Mobility is always important for evading damage, but... I would disagree with this, by the way. I think mobility is the strongest defensive stat in every single video game, but okay. It depends on how you want to play. Hypermobility lets you get more rapidly from quest to quest. So oh. I think it's going to be the fastest to go through the campaign. But you start dropping all those mobility powers when you're facing higher difficulty things in order to deal more damage or have more damage mitigation. So my He is right that if it's like Diablo 3, you will reach damage sponges. I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. He's got more experience of it, with it than I do character was my rogue that might be why i had the why that was my least favorite just because i really slammed my head against the wall difficulty wise my favorite was I, I played two different druid builds my favorite was the permanent werewolf stormcaster druid it just it felt so good i was never at resource loss the build just it just gelled now i need to stress i was given i love how he has to give a fucking a, a disclaimer. He's been talking for 30 minutes, no disclaimers. The moment he starts talking about Druid, he's like, okay, guys, listen. All right, so listen, you have to contextualize this. All right, so, all right, so basically, it, it's not like, okay, he, he, this is what it's really like. Fully synergized items and toolkits. These were fully put together and thought today. through builds. So what is the experience with just random gear on and a random build? I can't speak to that. I can't. But I just love the gameplay flow of that druid build. It felt so smooth. Which was in stark contrast to my experience in the beta. Yeah. And then my second favorite was a barbarian. It was a berserking build. Okay. It all revolved around benefiting from berserking as much as possible and buffing berserking. And again, it felt really good to play, really smooth. I'm not crazy about melee in general, so it was a step down from the druid. I can see a lot of people probably like melee in a lot of ARPGs doesn't feel good. With regards to just what I enjoy playing, but the build felt good. Then my third remained the sorcerer. I played a lightning build. And to clarify, the build that I was playing lightning. has all the changes that they listed from the, from the last the patch that we covered knife. last yes. week. So it wasn't the same, you know, overpowered lightning sorceress that we had in the beta. 
Yeah, Sorcerer. Of course, it's going to be the same overpowered Lightning Sorcerer. It's the same as Arc. Arc is one of the best spells in PoE. Like, bro, what are we even talking about? You're talking about a spell that auto aims. A spell that auto aims and chains to other mobs that it auto aims to. Scale that, and it's the best spell in the game. Remained as my number three. Come on. And then my number four was the Necromancer. The Necromancer, I was given a. It was a blood army build. What the fuck? And so it was this combination of using blood lance while also having oh, I minions. That. It was a pet build that also had me doing some of the active damage. Now, nerfs were made to minion survivability. I definitely felt that. My minions. I'm very much not a fan of the uh, resummoning minions. I, I'm I'm very concerned this is going to be tedious and unfun. Pretty much only died against a Shava back in the beta. They otherwise were almost always up. Now my minions were dying quite regularly. I was having to resummon them. I'm not gonna say constantly, but regularly as I'm going through. I would say that I never really reached a scenario where I was out of corpses. Or, that's not fair to say, no. I would be out of corpses sometimes, but I had a lot of means of generating corpses. Okay. So, sometimes I wasn't at full minions. I had maybe a couple out, but on average, I was generating enough corpses at a regular enough rate to be replenishing my army. Minions, or Minion Necromancer, will remain non targetable as in it's Diablo 2 style where your minions just go out and do whatever they want as opposed to Diablo 3 style where you can point to an enemy and your minions will target that enemy. I don't know why you can't have a unique that says whenever you cast Blood Lance or Bone Spike all of your minions attack the primary target of the Bone Lance or Blood Lance or uh, Bone Spike or Blood Lance. Why can't you have that? They probably will. I, I hope they do. I, I think there should be a unique like that. That's not my preferred play style, but that's the decision they wanted to go with. There are people that like dumb minions that'll just go do their own thing. And uh, again, not my preference, so yeah, I, don't I don't really like see that. myself going Summoner Necro. I really like that ability to point at an enemy and say, please attack this. Get they ass. That said, it's not that I had a lack of things to do. I could still be, again, I had my blood lance, so I was still actively doing quite a bit of stuff during the combat. I'm just not fond of the haphazard nature of minions just being this chaotic force that are doing whatever they want and not being able to target something in priority. Because Diablo 4 is a game where you often do want to be targeting things in priority. So I could imagine on a full minion build, where you mm -hmm. have no damage yourself, you know, maybe a blood cyst is going to appear on screen and you just got to hope and pray that your minions are going to go attack it before it explodes and kills you. It would be cool if maybe they could... Yeah, it just sucks. ...at least add a legendary power or a unique somewhere that lets you choose to target. Maybe it'll do it that you're... Once you're at max minions, instead of summoning a skeletal priest, it'll send your minions to attack. And it, it doesn't have to be the zoom-zoom mode like in Diablo 3 where your skeletons all instantly surge over. But just, you know, target this and they meander over and priority take down that target before any other. Sure. So I think that pretty sure, much yeah. covers the gameplay portion here. I'll say if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. I'll... I'll try to answer or come by my Twitch streams and we can have live discussions about things. Overall, I definitely gained a more robust understanding of what are we going to be doing day in, day out in Diablo 4. Overall, I had a great time. I'm glad I got to ask your most upvoted questions. And soon enough, the game will release and you'll have a lot of these questions answered for yourself. So that's going to wrap up this overly long and rambling video as I am uh, still recovering from my travels. But I'm going to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content. I feel like that video, for me, was like two hours. Like, I had so much stuff to say during that video, it was insane.
Yeah, I, I, bro, I was, I, I've been going on for a while about this, cause I, we haven't talked about Diablo Four for like a week. I've had a lot of shit to say, so yeah, I'm really curious to see what this stuff is gonna be. And I think that honestly, Blizzard can, uh, you know, they can have all the ideas they want, but uh, let's see the game come out and let's see how it actually plays, and then we'll get a real idea of what to expect. Because before then, you're just talking shit. So yeah, 34 minute video, yeah, fucking one, two hours and 34 minute video. Riker's great, we love Riker again. This guy is a, uh, a paragon, uh, no pun intended, of the Diablo community. He has been for a long time. Make sure to give him some support if you like Diablo videos. He's been putting out good content for literally a decade. So there you go. Talk 4x length of video. Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of stuff to say, man. Uh, one does not simply waltz into capstone dungeons. Yeah, I think that capstone dungeons being really hard and then things getting a bit easier after that, it's probably going to be a little bit more relaxing and a lot cleaner. So I'm glad to see that for sure.